All right. So can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sound is working. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, welcome, Sarah Middleton. Um, yeah. How have you been? You already told me you're busy, but how are you other than busy? Other than busy? Oh, I guess I try and keep my mind busy, so I guess it's like less time I spend in my head, I guess. <laughs> so I like to keep... Um, yeah. I, yeah, I like to keep busy, especially like with lockdown and things. So I just like to be involved in different things and talking to different people and doing my projects and things like that. Going for nature walks or that. Yeah. So all I'm right. busy in different ways. <laughs> yeah, but always, always busy. Sorry, I've got this bizarre shadow on my face. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Um, are you ready for your bio? Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> okay. All right. So Sarah Middleton is a plant ecologist and science communicator extraordinaire. Sarah is pursuing a PhD in plant ecology at Oxford University, studying plant functional ecology and drought through the raindrop experiment. A long yet incomplete list of her accomplishments and endeavors include launching the Black British Biology Project, being the project coordinator of the Banana Gadden film, founding the Human Nature Stories Project, working on decolonizing ecology and working on securing her spot as the most accomplished scientist and human in the 21st century. I am honored to get to chat with you, Sarah, and would like to announce my newest project right here today. It's the founding of the Sarah Lil Middleton fan club. <laughs> so, I'm so glad to have you on. Thank you. Oh, wow. It's very strange to kind of hear all those things, but thanks yeah, for having me well, on. <laughs> it's it's there it's real so you deserve it there they are well some of them some of them um yeah so i guess if we could just start with kind of who is sarah and um what do you do what do i do yeah okay yeah i always find it tricky when people ask so i say like plant ecologist but i feel like i'm a plant ecologist science communicator photographer documentary filmmaker there's so many like slashes and slashes so i yeah, just kind yeah. of abbreviate it to kind of like plant ecologist and then you can ask me questions um so yeah i guess yeah who am i um yeah phd student as you said um so like plants are really like my world um in many different ways um so i'm studying um sort of like using functional traits and demography and looking at plant plant interactions at the raindrop site I've got that side. I also like plants um, in terms of looking at plant awareness disparity, so people's relationship to plants. Um, I enjoy cooking with plants. <laughs> I enjoy having house plants. Um, so yeah, plants are really my world, and that's kind of how I uh, interact with with nature and plants and things. Yeah. So plants. Multifaceted. <laughs> yeah. I have my plant tea mug. Well, it's not a tea mug, but you know, it's a mug. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You could probably ID some of those. I can't. I'm not a botanist. So, you know, people ask me lots of plant questions and if it's not tree related, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite forgetful with like, um, plant like names so i have to like look them up often or like i have it in my head but like i like forget what the yeah, the other word is <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the other day i was um kind of walking around in my yard and i was uh you know filming saying oh this is this tree this is this tree and like i went back and went over it and was like all of these like names are wrong <laughs> so i had to scrap the whole thing <laughs> So yeah. it's okay. It's, you know, sometimes you memorize them, sometimes they don't come out quite the right yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for that. Uh, so your world revolves around plants, mm -hmm. essentially. But, okay, I mean, I don't even know where to start, honestly, and I've, and I've like, gone over this a million times <laughs> because there's so many different projects that you're, that you're part of. Um, and... Uh, is there any, and, and I say like the projects, but then there's also obviously like the research you do, the heavy research on, um, uh, you know, drought and uh, are you doing modeling with that? Can you kind of just, how about this? How about you just kind of go over your, what your PhD is about? 
Oh, okay, yeah, sure. So um, it's about basically can we use functional traits as like a shortcut to understanding how different plant communities respond to environmental change because they're being used a lot um, in the literature. There's like thousands of papers. Like if you go on like the web of science and stuff, and you see like functional traits, it's like a buzzword in ecology at the moment. Yeah. Um, and it's very often used to kind of as a predictive science. Um, as a shortcut because you can measure all these sort of things so like plant heights or like if we're thinking about plants they also use in animal ecology and also in like fungi and increasingly like bacteria if we think about plants um things like i don't know root depth or any sort of morphological kind of traits there's also ecophysiological different types of traits um yeah and they're sort of being used as almost like a checklist um just to kind of say uh, especially like for example in invasion science you're trying to like predict the next invasive species like oh if it has like I don't know super big leaves or like um, I don't know certain uh, secondary metabolites or something like that um, yeah, yeah, it might be yeah. more invasive so it's like being used in that sort of capacity um, but very often like functional traits aren't linked to their fitness um, in terms of how they affect vital rates so the survival growth and reproduction the plants that I'm in this project I'm trying to do is like link them together and see if they can actually be predictive in terms of uh, demographic rates. Yeah. And then I'm adding like an extra layer, well, extra two layers because it's in a, a drought treatment, so seeing what effect that has on the plants. Um, and also looking at plant plant interactions as well. So try to look at it from different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, there's, that's a multifaceted. Um, thing you've got going on for sure. So you're looking at the plant functional traits and then you're also looking at the, the functional traits with the drought, I guess, that you're simulating, right? Yeah, in the drought experiment, yeah, yeah. So there's these, um, the raindrop site, there's these uh, drought shelters which intercept some of the rainfall. Yeah. And then redirect some of it to like where the other treatment which is like irrigated. So you get like a contrast between the extremes of very droughted and um more irrigated yeah no that's really cool i saw the um like drone footage on your website mm -hmm. that was that was really cool or maybe it was your labs i can't remember but one of the the websites that was really cool seeing the experience yeah, yeah my supervisor got his drone out and um yeah and you can see it from above yeah it's very different from kind of um a lot of my work involves sort of bending down, being very close yeah. to the plants. I think <laughs> yeah. like a, another perspective is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Your aerial view from like a, a couple, like a meter off the ground or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very <laughs> no, different. That's really cool. Thanks, thanks for that. I feel like, you know, um, th that world is, uh, you either know it or you don't. You know, it's kind of how I feel. Um, those that work, you know, like either on the micro side of things or the chemistry side of things or in the macro, um, you know, like I, I'm fascinated by, and no, you know, several of my friends that are eco-phys uh, people and like that just, it's, I just don't understand that world. It's not I, some, not something that I was trained in or um, kind of honestly, like quite honestly, it was just too complex for me. So I stuck to something that seemed way more simple. <laughs> Like that's a tree. Here's its bark. I can tell what it is, you know. But uh, no, thanks for that. That's really cool. Um, and I did want to. Add, there's just so many other things. And if you want to talk more on anything, like if you want to dive into more about uh, your your research, cool. Like totally, it's yours. Um, but I want to ask you some other things too. So if we can have just like if we can leave off right here, where would people? Where would you direct people to? um learn more about your research that you do yeah i suppose um you can follow me on twitter let's see if i remember my twitter handle at i wrote it down <laughs> so, underscore lil lil underscore plants i think it is did i get it right at sarah <laughs> yeah because i always see it like written so like in my head yeah. <laughs> I think that's correct. Maybe you could like link it or something. I'll link it. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. You've got too much to like keep in your head. You know, Twitter handle it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, on my website. Okay. As well. And I'll yeah, link which is my full name. Yeah, dot com. Okay. Um, no, not literally full name. Sorry, my full name dot com. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, a different website. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't go there. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. All right, so um, 
like I literally have like a page of questions, but I, I know that like we won't be able to cover it in this bit of time. So um, can you tell me more about uh, the Black British uh, Biology Project? Because uh, that's really cool that you started that. Yeah, so it really um, started off, well, I've kind of had it in my back of my mind, these sort of ideas about uh, representation. Mm-hmm. And I think it really came to the forefront um, with the bl- whole Black Lives Matter, even though the, the movement started a while ago, but I think with the George Floyd protest. Yep. Like, yeah, it just like, it was very raw. And I was like, there's always this portrait, not always, but the majority of the narrative around sort of black people is very negative. It's to do with kind of gangs or like not being sort of successful and very negative. And I was like, can we flip this narrative? So I was like, there's so many wonderful contributions that black people have made to science. Um, and I wanted to focus specifically on um, British um, biologists because there's quite a lot sort of in the US with um, yeah. George Washington Carver, etc. So I was like, but there's, I did a bit of literature search and I didn't find any sort of resources about um, uh, black British um, biologists. So I was like, well, I'll just make my own. Then. <laughs> yeah. um, I see a niche. I'll just, uh, yeah. Um, you know, do some research there. So that's kind of where I set it up. Um, yeah. Why I set it up. So I haven't uh, yet made the website that's still like ongoing when I have a bit of yeah, time. Yeah. But, um, I'm yeah I saw that. As well. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm slowly like um, going through like resources and things. So I want to make it like an open access um, sort of site repository so everyone, educators and people who are interested can use that um, for t- from teaching sort of undergrads or even like children as well. I think it's really important to yeah. have uh, representation because that was something for me so related to representation as a kid. I had like no sort of role models in science, even though I was really interested in nature and environmental science. And that I would have loved to like have more yeah representation so i guess i'm kind of doing it also for my younger self <laughs> yeah yeah um, no that's awesome um i was gonna ask you in particular like on your on your website where you have i'm gonna kind of walk people through here's a tutorial for sarah's website um <laughs> she has projects at the top in the menu and if you click that you come down and you click the black british uh oh my gosh i said it wrong black british biology project um <laughs> the person who's on there is john edmonston is that right Mm -hmm. yeah can you tell me about him because that like it's like it's shocking but not because so often we're finding so many marginalized people in throughout history were just i mean they were marginalized like they were written off so could you tell me about him yeah i find it yeah i find it still astounding actually that uh especially because he's linked to charles darwin yeah so charles darwin everyone pretty much everyone knows Charles Darwin and um, evolution and so forth um, but many people aren't aware that he had a tutor um, while he was at Edinburgh when he was uh, late late teens or you know early 20s um, who was teaching which is John Edmonston who was a former slave from Guyana um, who taught him taxidermy so how to um, I guess preserve dead animals um, and he gave him, I think, 40 hours of tuition or something. So, like, a, lo- a lot of uh, tuition. And it's because it's quite, you know, um, fine-tuning skills and things like that. Um, and, um, but in interestingly, in, like, Darwin's notes, there's, like, no mention of him. So, like, I think uh, historians have, like, got different um, accounts from everywhere and, and sort of p- pieced it together and realised it was actually John Edmondson that taught him these skills. And as we know, he goes on his... Uh, Eagle trip uh, to you know the Galapagos and, and so forth and his Darwin Finches and use those skills, which yeah. I'm sure helped him um, fine tune his you know his theories and things. But yeah, he's not recognised. Well, I didn't learn about it in school, and I was like, no, yeah, I was an, an, an adult when I found out about. It's like wow, someone yeah. as famous as Charles Darwin, and we don't know about um, how influential this um, this person John Edmonston is. No, I I mean that's. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like you can have a whole chat just about that and, and much more because that's phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. All right. So that's hard to just move on from that, honestly. <laughs> like, I want to know more. It, I mean, like, have you have you dove into that more? Or is that kind of, I mean, it's kind of hard to piece together much more from that? That's probably the most 
uh, sort of an overview. But I, I think it's really interesting, like, if, um, like, how many more are there out there, like, that haven't been recorded, you yeah. know, through the archives? So I, I find that really interesting, kind of, I enjoy sort of history as well. So that's my multidisciplinary brain, kind of. <laughs> bringing yeah. those different worlds together history and biology um yeah, yeah no i'm so glad you did yeah so um yeah all right cool okay so i'm gonna move from one project to another because there's <laughs> so many under your belt um the banana geddon film so oh, yeah. how, how did that start um that i just like that is the coolest thing and i feel like i don't know if i saw your film because this was a few years ago right or a couple years yeah so it's not um completed yet so we have like several trailers oh okay okay cool um because it's like it's, it's quite a long sort of process and, and covid has kind of slowed things down but um yeah i guess it started um uh, when was that 20 end of 2016 okay. group of us met, um while we we're at imperial college doing our masters um and then the team leader jackie um it was at the end of a yoga session, actually. And I was like, <laughs> reading this book about bananas or food or something. And she was like, you know, there's a real issue with bananas. I was like, no, what, what's it all about? Because I was interested in sort of agriculture, where our food comes from in general. Okay. And then she, yeah, she talked about this. And I was like, oh, wow. And she was like, oh, I'd love to like sort of document this. And then somehow we like, a group of us just kind of came together. Like we didn't really know each other from before. Okay. And then we applied for, for, funding to uh imperial they had this like funding board um to do this project about bananas about a documentary about bananas just to document kind of how they're grown the sustainability issues um so it was quite a sort of small idea but now it's like mushroomed into quite a big thing <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah we interviewed um so yes yeah, so kind of going from that we interviewed more than 40 people along the sort of banana supply chain from from uh, small scale producers um, to uh, packing workers to scientists, journalists, all kinds of people that have some stakehold in the whole banana supply chain. So it's, it's really eye opening actually to see that the whole industry. Oh yeah, I can't imagine. I like the just the idea of it. Um... So like what I kind of wrote down here was, this, this is my, uh, my synopsis, it, was, uh, it, it examines the history of bananas, how the Cavendish variety and monoculture system uh, is perpetuating a fungal pathogen threatening banana kind. Like, I mean, that's, that's, that's right, right? I mean, like there's, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. yeah I, that's wild. Like, I feel like this was talked about Maybe maybe it's, that's it. I just kind of heard, heard some buzz about it a couple of years ago. Um, but like, this is really cool that you're y'all are taking on this project. And so, what's kind of the idea of it? I mean, obviously you have COVID going on right now, but um, yeah. So we're, we're dealing with our own pandemic, but bananas have their own pandemic as yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, we want to yeah make it into a well finish the documentary. <laughs> yeah. Um, we still have like a few. Um, people that we want to interview to kind of um, make the story more whole yeah. so to talk to reta retailers as well because they're a big piece in the in the whole um, supply chain as well to get their side as well yeah um, but yes yeah, so we I guess yeah overall make the documentary and looking at the different um, uh, so social issues economic issues and environmental issues as well yeah very um, cool so yeah I've never looked at the banana the same way again <laughs> yeah no it no, really, I, really I, changes you and your choices that you make in the supermarket and in food in general. Kind of seeing where it's grown and how much hard work it is because it's 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 not mechanized; it's done by hand. Um, so yeah, no, that's yes, really cool. All the world, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really fascinating for sure. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump to another project of yours, <laughs> or at least it seems to be another like just a big passion. I don't know, like if it's um. I don't know how compartmentalized it is, but I would imagine something like um, your like the concept of open science and for early uh, early career researchers. So you've written, I think, like magazine articles, right? Or is this something you've written that's been published as well, or maybe both? Yeah, so that came out of um, a really really great experience um, 
uh, called the Plant Functional Trait course, um, which happens, uh, well, was happening yearly, but now COVID has kind of messed things up a bit. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, we went last year into Peru um, to measure a whole bunch of functional traits and things like that, which was really helpful for um, my field work as well. Um, but a large component of that was to do with open science and in terms of um, right away from uh, designing projects to collecting the data, managing the data, to analyzing. So the whole kind of pipeline. Yeah. And based on that experience, um, a group of us um, wrote a paper about how we can use field courses as a way to teach uh, students or participants on that, on that course about open science practices. So through the whole sort of um, pipeline. And that was a really cool experience as well because I've never been like formally taught those things and I was like yeah you taught from undergraduate I think not waiting until my PhD to kind of stumble across these things because they're really important you know practices like yeah. having open access of your code and so forth and many, there's many different components so, so yeah that's been really eye-opening as well actually that experience and that was very yeah yeah no, that's that's awesome and I mean just like I could add, you know, just my experience with that too. Um, and so many people, starting to rain, uh, so many people that uh, I've talked to that have gotten into ecology, it's, you know, for a lot of people, they had access to um, rural areas where they grew up in rural areas. And so that was just kind of like their way of life, you know, like nature to them was up their back door. That was not true for everybody. Um, and, you know, it really, and it, it was for me, I mean, that's what, that's why I love nature is because I had just an abundance of it um, and was alone in the woods like all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And, but like those, in those field courses where I got out and especially the ones that were kind of a short term, you know, like a week long mm -hmm. um, field course, like those, those were the best. And that's whenever I actually felt like a scientist. And uh, mm. So yeah, I, I love it, you know, I definitely love uh, anything that opens that access and it's it's opening like a whole window to science that um, you don't have otherwise, for sure. Yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, no, yeah it's almost like a missed opportunity not to incorporate them and that's kind of what we argue in the, in the paper and the uh, blog as well. Yeah, no, that's really cool. I like that. Um, okay, here's a question. Why this is to your research um because got mosquitoes too oh it's like almost <laughs> spring um why um did you focus on false broom oh the um, hmm. that species yeah. um oh sorry oh yeah <laughs> sorry i this is in my head because like i was reading this and i was like of all the species like why why that you know yeah sorry i got like, in my head is yeah it's brachypodium um Sylvaticum, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not a bot, like I said. <laughs> um, no, 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 yeah, because in my head, yeah. <laughs> but it's cool, I got it. Um, yeah, so I chose the species um, mostly for practical reasons. Um, so um, to do the demography side of it, you have to, I'm also like tagging the, the individuals. Okay. And in order to build like the, the, the model, you have to, for the matrix population models and, um, and so forth, you need a lot of data, you need a lot of individuals to, to track, and that was the uh, most dominant species there. Okay, all right. So it's on a sort of practical side. And also, like, it has quite um, distinct bunches, so it's quite easy to tell what sort of an individual sort of bunch is. Okay, so is it a bunch grass? Is that... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it doesn't really um, send out uh, what they're called... Still ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, not like little strawberries that kind of send out yeah. money. um because that really complicates things yeah. uh, <laughs> and um yes yeah, so, and it was like easy to tag because i there's quite a lot of species at the site so there's more than a hundred different species oh, wow. uh, so you've got legumes a few types of orchids um lots of yeah sort of flowering plants there um but that was kind of the best candidate because there's another one that i really so i really like um uh, for basically like bean species uh -huh. um so i wanted to do it on lotus cornicolatus which is um i forgot what the common name is but it's like a little yellow yellow and red sort of bean um okay. but that kind of forms like quite a dense map it's really hard to tell when it where it ends yeah. <laughs> so i was like okay. start and the other begins yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 
but I am noting, so I'm also looking at plant plant interactions. So I have my focal species and then I have um, a record in a like 30 centimeter radius around it. And I record the other species as well. So like it yeah. is part of the project, but it's not the focal species. Um, so yeah, I really love to love, uh, sorry, I really come to love grasses. Um, I have a sort of new appreciation for them because um, I didn't really know much about them before. So I'm actually learning quite a lot um, working in the grassland. Yeah, no, that's cool. I underappreciate considering yeah. that grasslands cover, I think it's like a third to 40% of the land yeah. coverage of the, the world. So, yeah, right. Definitely underappreciated, that's for sure. Um, I'm there, it's it's a whole nother world, too. I mean, like, I guess for you because you do trees, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, anything that's less than you know, um, I don't know, two meters is like you know, a whole new world for me, so. <laughs> But grasses, I mean, they definitely, they're such a, no you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't touch the grasses, yeah, I, you know, I literally touch them, but I don't, you know, try to understand them, yeah, so, they're cool, I think they're great, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's where it kind of ends for me, <laughs> um, okay, so, I'm going to move on to the really hard questions, <laughs> yeah, I know. So this one is my favorite question to ask and my least favorite to answer because I can never answer it myself. Okay, what is your favorite tree? Oh, that's really cruel. Um, <laughs> I'll say like a, not a specific species, but like a group, um, birch. I really like birch. Okay, so yeah. I, um, probably like the downy birch, I would say. Okay, yeah. Um, because it just brings sort of back nice memories of when I was in Iceland um, when oh, I was doing some wow. animation work there. And they're really, because you know Iceland's pretty like harsh climate in terms of like yeah. for winds. And Are they really stunted trees? I don't know and anything about them. They're really small. <laughs> oh wow, that's <laughs> so like, cool. The willows are quite small, but they're really, really small and it was really <laughs> funny. Um, the, the, the head of like the conservation sort of person was saying like if you kind of get lost while you're doing your work just like stand up and then you'll be able to kind of see how to get back um it's not like the redwoods they're really small yeah so yeah really yeah, yeah and i really like the bark texture as well okay so. yeah i'll have to look it up i don't know anything it's the downy birch yeah or just general like birch like oh, silver yeah. birch is nice yeah, yeah. um so yeah and yeah, okay to answer your question i'd say like birch trees yeah okay I guess All it's right. not a single. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got you. That's cool. No, I, I like, I like answers like that. I, I can relate. It's, it's really hard to narrow down like a species, and sometimes let alone like a genus, and you know. So yeah, that's all right. Okay. Yeah. So, what is your favorite fireside food and beverage? Ooh. Um. Again, this takes me back to Iceland. Um, okay. Probably like the Swiss mist. Um, drink, do you know, like yeah. the hot chocolate? <laughs> I like, like it too, yeah, yeah. More than 50% sugar, I think it is. <laughs> yes. It is great, like, after like doing, I don't know, 20 kilometers of hiking or something, just getting back to that, and then having like a campfire and chatting to other people. Yeah. Um, another thing, which is not like exclusively campfire food, but like related also to hiking, is like, well, apart from like schmores and things, but like bread, this is really calorific, but it's great. <laughs> um, butter or margarine, peanut butter, honey, and then like sliced banana. And if oh, you I like really a, a bit of like chocolate spread, and then like close it up like that and then eat it. <laughs> that was great, especially if it's like really cold as well. So, yeah, um, yeah. I had that a lot in Iceland. Um, we did quite a lot of campfires. Yeah, that's cool. But again, yeah, it brings like back the memories. And the Swiss, and the Swiss, yeah. But I wouldn't have it like ordinary, like in the house kind of Swiss miss. It's more like if I'm hiking or camping and it's like a, a fire yeah. fleet. So that's probably Yeah, no, those are nice. Those, you know, anything that you can make just by like opening a can um, or like tearing that packet and mm -hmm. uh, boil some water and it's like instant gratification because you usually mm -hmm. earn it. Like, you know, usually if you're around a campfire, it's usually because you've like earned the right to be there, you know, so calories yeah. like you deserve it treat yourself yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it sounds like you do it you do it right around the campfire that's for sure like that's yeah that sounds pretty nice i like that all right um so why does your area of interest matter to you like what's 
why did you kind of go into the research that you did? Oh, um, I guess it's kind of been a slow progression from undergraduate level. Okay. where I was working with um, invasive species. This was in Iceland again. Iceland keeps coming up, but um, looking at the invasive lupin. And then uh, in my master's at Imperial, I was looking at functional traits and invasive species. And then now I've kind of transitioned into looking just at functional traits, but more broadly and not just sort of in invasion science. Yeah. Even though the species that I'm looking at is actually invasive in North America, but I'm looking at it as in its native range. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's just been a sort of general progression of interest. And as I kind of said at the beginning with the functional traits, the, there's kind of the buzzword and I'm really interested to take like a deep dive and really kind of go under the hood and really look at, um, can we use it as a shortcut basically? Yeah, um, no, that's really cool. I like that. Yeah, well done. That was a great way to just kind of succinctly describe. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have a favorite science or life quote? Oh, um, that's a hard one. Um, probably, I guess, well, it's, it turned into a song, but you know the song, um, Wear Sunscreen? It was like this, and it turned into like a song. It came out in the 90s or something. No, I don't know. Oh, you know I'm, yeah, so I'm going to get like, grilled for this, I know, but no. Oh, I can send it to you afterwards, but it's about okay, sort of please. like life advice. And it's like a whole bunch of things like be kind to your knees, don't over bleach your hair. Um, but there's one bit where it's like, don't waste your time on jealousy because everyone's like on their own sort of path. I can't remember the quote exactly. Yeah, yeah. But um, just kind of do your thing and try not to compare yourself to sort of other people. Um, yeah. I probably, yeah. That's not the exact quote, but that's kind of the, the essence of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah, it's a cool. great, it's one of my favorites. Um, I mean, it was like a, a, a spoken word thing, and then they turned it into like a song. But um, okay, but it's great. No, that's, that's cool. yeah, that's probably a life quote. <laughs> no, I know, I like that. That's that's really similar to my. You know, one of my favorites is it's actually when I was in high school, I was really into. Well, I wanted to be into, and I thought I was into, but I really like sucked at it. But uh, BMX, like riding bikes through trails and stuff, mm -hmm. and. Um, and, you know, like I had the, um, had a magazine that was, you know, on bikes and stuff. And uh, one of the writers said it was like a very, uh, <laughs> like uh, BMX writer thing to say. Uh, it wasn't like the most um, intelligent way to put something, but it mm -hmm. is how I talk. So, you know, it made sense to me. And it was like, uh, don't knock somebody's passion um, that's different than yours because you have an equal amount of passion for the thing that you do. And, you know, oh, like, nice. yeah, it really like was formative for me at that age, you know, like 16, whatever I was. And I just realized, you know, everybody's kind of, they do that. Like everybody puts people down for the thing that they're interested in when they're like just as passionate, you know, like now, you know, we can nerd out, right? And like some people are like, well, are you talking about plants like 24 seven, but we get it, you know, and they're talking about whatever they're talking about. And so, yeah, so I really like that. It's cool how like some pop culture things can be like some of the most influential, you know, doesn't have to be like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the deepest of, of deep things. Yeah, that's cool. All right, well, that was- Yeah, I like that. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. All right, well, is there anything that you would like to say to anybody or do you have like a takeaway message of something Sarah wants to leave for the world? Ooh. Uh, Super broad. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess the cliche, like follow your passions, be brave. Don't be afraid to say yes to things, but also don't be afraid to say no to things. Um, yeah, probably that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, that's sage advice. I like it. That's good. Okay, well, um, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to do so? We kind of already said that, but you specifically. Yeah, I guess um, my Twitter, which I think I said correctly before, okay. or my website. <laughs> Not for right, fame dot com. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess the yeah, link. <laughs> I'll make sure I post it correctly. I'll like shoot you a message or whatever. 
if I get it wrong. Okay, well, it was so great to chat with you, Sarah, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again, and maybe we can chat another time. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. All right, thanks. <laughs> I'll see you later. See you on the Twitterverse, at least. So, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, Sarah. Bye, bye. <laughs>